couple things before we get started. Uh, many of you know that our good friend and member uh, Doreen Stenger passed away this week. Um, and uh, many of you might be wondering what's, uh, what's going to be happening. There's not going to be any services or any memorial until next spring. They're waiting for the COVID to kind of get settled and get away. So there won't be anything until next spring. So you don't have to <clears throat> worry about that. It's great to see so many people here today, uh, especially with Sunday school starting again. We're starting to get a little bit back to normal. We got kids' church going on today. Uh, they're back there probably going crazy with the kids, and, but that's a good thing. It's good to have everybody back. I hope that you're glad to be back too. Gradually, you know, for those who are here and those who are online still watching, if you don't feel comfortable coming, that's fine. You know, or if you want to wear a mask when you come, that's fine too. Don't feel guilt about anything. We just love you. We want to make sure you're doing okay. So if we call and check on you, we're not calling to check and get after you about not being here. We're just calling to check and make sure you're feeling well and doing okay. So, and I, and I hope that you'll be doing that with each other too <clears throat> with, uh, during this particular time. A couple of things too. Uh, remember, we have baptisms coming up August the 2nd out at the Stolly uh, Baptismal uh, Farm. And uh, there are sign-ups. If you haven't signed up yet, please sign up or let me know so I can get your name down. That's August the 2nd. We also, a couple things coming up. We have our <clears throat> back-to-school bash out at the desk. There are sign-ups. We need uh, items and things for back-to-school school supplies. Also, we have uh, IHN uh, coming up in the next week or so. And we need people and we need food. And uh, the IHN folks, Interfaith Hospitality, are not staying here at the church. They're at hotels. So we have to deliver the food and stuff to them. So we need some, uh, we need a few more people than we normally need. So make sure you see Kelly Fitzgerald. She'll be out front afterwards and you can sign up for, uh, to help out with those things. These are all outreaches to the community and they're important things that we do as the church. We are to be the church. We're to be doers of the words, not just hearers of the word. So we need to be out amongst people and helping them uh, in whatever ways they need help. I think this is probably a pretty observant group. Are you all pretty observant? Do you, what do you observe when you walk in our door and you start walking down the hallway down towards the gymnasium? What do you observe? What do you see? Anything on the walls? What do you see? What is it? What is it? Speak out. It's okay. You can talk. Our motto. Our motto yes. So what does it say? Real people, real freedom. Real people seeking real freedom. That's what new freedom is to be about. That's our goal. That's our motto. That's our, that's our vision for this church. For anybody who comes here will learn to become real people and experience real freedom in their life. Now, and that's what we're going to talk about today is real people, what it means to be real people, what it means to experience real freedom. Now, in order to know what is real, you have to be able to recognize what is not real. Would that be correct? You have to, right? So, if I were to, uh, here's a dollar bill. Is this real? How do you know? Just because I have it? No, how do you know it's real? You have to do what? You have to spend it. You got to spend it. Then you'll find out if it's real or not, right? Some places they even mark them now, the bills to make sure they're real because there's counterfeit bills. What about this? Is this a real golf ball? Looks like one, doesn't it? Yeah, golf balls are pretty small. How would we know whether this is real or not? It's not real. It's rubber. What about this? Is this a real egg? Is this a real egg? Looks like it, doesn't it? Uh, no, it's not a real egg. But it looks like one. The only way you know whether it's real or not is to crack it, right? What about this? Is this a real baseball? Looks like one, doesn't it? It's the right size. How do you know if it's real or not? 
How would you know it's real? You have to use it. You have to hold it. You'd have to throw it. You'd have to hit it to see if it's real. It's not real, but it looks real. What about this holy Bible? Is this a real Bible? You got to open up to see what's inside, don't you? This is not a real Bible. But it looks like one. There's a lot of people walking around that say they're Christian and that they're walking around in freedom, but it's not real. It's not real. You can say anything you want, but until it's tested, it's not real. Real means it's not artificial or it's not, it means it's authentic. It's down to earth. Are you down to earth or are you holier than thou? If you walk around thinking you know everything and have all the answers and you're holier than everybody else, you're not a real person. You're fake. You're fake. We're fake. God's looking for real people. See, how is the world going to know the real Jesus unless people who say they belong to him are real Christians? Just saying you're Christian doesn't mean you're a Christian. Reading your Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Praying doesn't make you a Christian. Giving offerings every Sunday doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. I love writing our bunkie. He said, just because you sleep in the garage overnight doesn't make you a car. Real. What does it mean? See, if, if people who come and visit here, and I don't know if we have any guests today or not, but if they come and they walk in and if they see that sign, what do, you, what do you suppose they expect to find here? Real people living in real freedom. My question to you is, are you real and are you living in real freedom? That's our goal. That's what we're supposed to be working towards. Maybe we'll never completely get there. But that's not what matters. What matters is that the journey that we're on with God, the journey we're on with him to allow him to make us real and to help us to learn to live in freedom, really true freedom, a political system. The United States of America, the president, the Senate, all those people do not make you free. You only become free when Jesus makes you free. It's the only way you become truly free. We can be free for a while. We're sure, we're free from some things, right? But are they, do they always last a long time? No. The only true freedom that you and I will ever experience is if we allow Jesus to change our life and to make us free. Free from the things of this world. Free from thinking we have to live and go by the, what the world thinks instead of what the Lord tells us and what this word says. When we can live in this word and not be ashamed of it and live it freely and openly, then we are free. Unashamed. Unashamed. Or do we just say we're Christians when it's convenient? Do we just pray when we need something? Do we go to church when it's convenient? We go to church because we want people, everybody to know we go to church. We go to church because our mom and dad told us we have to go. I went to church that way for a long while. I was drugged when I was a kid. I was drugged to church. I was drugged here. I was drugged there by my mom and dad. The best place he ever drugged me was to church. Yes. Absolutely. And so, and, you know, and when I was drugged to church, I had to learn to act right. My mom set me free by whipping my behind. She set me free to know how to live and how to be a Christian and be in church and worship God. But when I didn't act right, she took me outside, whipped my behind and brought me back in and sat down until I learned to act right. That set me free. It set me free. Today we're going to look at John chapter 8. We're going to be in chapter 8 talking about real freedom. And uh, how uh, we can attain real freedom, what it means to be free. 
John chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 31. I'm going to read all the verses uh, to you. There's just a few of them, and then we'll go back over them. Verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And if you shall know the truth, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. <clears throat> they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Free indeed. Let's go back and look at verse 31. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples. What does it mean to abide? Abide means you go there and you stay there. You abide in his word. You go there daily. You stay there. You don't have to be in it all day long, but you should be in it every day. Even if you only read a verse. Read a verse. Let it speak to you. Some people say, oh, I can't understand the Bible. It's so complicated. Well, some of the words are complicated, but the idea of the way we live, that God asks us to live, is very quite simple. It's not complicated. It's very simple. But it's not easy to do. If it were easy, everybody would live that way. It's not easy to love all people. It's not easy to forgive all the time, unconditionally, or to love unconditionally. It's not easy to be compassionate to all people. It's not easy, it's, it's not easy to be merciful to people who aren't merciful to you. It's not easy to pray for your enemies. That's what the word calls us to do, is to do those things. So he wants us to abide. If we abide in his word, that means we abide in his word, this word right here, we are his disciples because we are trying to learn the way he wants us to live. See, the way he wants us to live is the way that will set us free from the world will set us free from ourselves, will set us free to live a life that he's called us, each and every one of us to live. Because every one of us, we're created in his image, and every one of us have, a, have something, he's created us to do something that nobody else can do in this world. To reach somebody that only you can reach, only that I can reach. We all have a purpose. And until we are free, free indeed, will not know that purpose. Verse 32, it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What is the truth? The truth is the word. What does it say in the beginning of John? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is the word of God. The word of God will set you and set me free. If. If we are willing and choose to abide by it as best we can. We're never going to be perfect. God never ever said anywhere he expects us to be perfect. Nowhere in the word does it say we have to be perfect. Nowhere. And you know why it, it doesn't say it? Because he knows we can't be. Because we're humans. He created us. He knows us inside and out. We can't fool him for a second. He knows us that well. And, he, and, he, and he, the best part about it, in spite of all of it, he loves us anyway. He loves us anyway with all of our faults, all of our shortcomings. So he's not intimidated by our shortcomings, no more than he's, no more than he's impressed by the things that we can do really well. See, it's not about any of those things. It's about abiding in him. It's about allowing him to enter our lives. It's about allow, allowing him to enter our lives and changing us. See, when we have deep scars, even if you get a cut, I just had surgery. I have a deep, I have a deep wound, but it's gonna, it can't heal from the outside. It has to heal from the inside out. When you have deep wounds in your life that have cut you deep in your heart, 
whether it's through loss, whether it's through mistreatment, whether it's through whatever it might be, that wound must start healing on the inside in your heart and then heal outward. You can't just throw a scab over it. You can't just throw a Band-Aid over it because it may never heal. You have to allow it to heal from the inside out and you have to allow the Lord to get there and be the healer of your soul. He is the only one who can heal it and heal it perfectly and heal it forever. The only permanent fix. The only permanent fix there is. Verse 33. They answer him, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been bondage to anyone. How can you say we'll be made free? Well, if they'd think about what they were saying, who had they been in bondage to? They'd been in bondage to the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and now in Rome. They were slaves and didn't even know it. They didn't think they were slaves, but they were slaves for years and years. Moses came along and God used him to free them from bondage for 400 years. He offered it to them, but they didn't take it. They could have been free as could be, but they always found excuses for not taking that freedom. They'd rather gone back to Egypt than to live in the desert because at least in Egypt they knew what was gonna happen When you walk into the unknown, when you walk into the unknown with the Lord, you don't always know what's going to happen. But I've found out through my years of walking with him, it's always good. It's always good. It's always better than it was before. In so many ways. Always better. At peace. Being able to lay my head down at night and sleep in peace. Knowing that I have done my best with his help to live as the person he's called me to be. But they said, we've never been been enslaved. Besides that, we're descendants of Abraham. We don't have to worry about us, Lord. We're already in. We've already made it. People do the same thing today. Well, you know, my uncle's a pastor, so I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I go to church every Sunday, I'm good. My dad's a pastor. I'm good. Well, my wife goes to church, so I don't really have to go. No, see, one day, and we don't know when that day is going to be, one day we will be standing before God face to face and have to make an account for ourselves and the way we've lived. Just me and him, just you and him face to face. You don't get to take any letters of recommendation. You don't get to take anything with you, but just you and him. He's got it all written down. All written down. But does he expect you to be perfect? No. What he expects to do, what he's going to weigh is your heart. He's going to weigh your heart. The reason why you do things, that's what he cares about. What is your motivation? Is it, is it selfish or is it for other people? And is it for to glorify him? See, I, 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 don't wanna, I don't wanna appear to him before him one day and him go, Dennis, you know, there was this person I sent to you that needed help and you looked at them and said, there's nothing wrong with them. They should be working. I shouldn't have to help them give them any food. I shouldn't have to help them, they're just lazy. I don't have I can't do that. Not if I say who I am. Not if I say if I'm a Christian who I say I'm going to be, who I'm supposed to be. See, there's a scripture that haunts me, and it's in the it's in the uh, in the chapter five of Luke, I believe it is, where it says, uh, "If someone asks you for your coat, give them your cloak also. And if they ask you to walk one mile, walk two miles." And then there's the last verse that haunts me. It says, and to everyone who asks, give, period. That haunts me because we want to make judgments, don't we? We want to decide whether people deserve to be helped or not. 
Do you think the Lord looked at you and said, yeah, they're just lazy. They don't need to, I'm not helping them. No. That's not how he looks at us. He knows we need help. And he's always, always, always willing and ready to lend a hand, to put a hand out. Always ready. So we can't rely on somebody else. Our relationship with God is ours. I, you know, I used to worry about, I used to worry about when I died and I went before God, all my family would be there standing around and they'd find out all the things I did I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> I'm certainly glad that's not the way it is. Just me and him. Just me and him. And I want to be, I want to be able to, I want him to be able to look at my life and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. Come on in. That's what I want more than anything. See, Lord wants us to be happy in our lives and have a good life, but he's more worried about us being holy than he is being happy. The reason being, because he knows if we will be holy, we'll be happy. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. It's a promise. God doesn't lie, his promises are true. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Any, any sin that you commit, and you do commit them, by the way, in case you didn't know that, in case you forgot about it and thought you lived perfectly, we all have sin in our life, some big, some small, but sin, is, sin to God is sin. Sin to God is sin. All of us have them. All of us have little sins that we don't like to, to let loose of because we like them too much. We like to be victims. We like to feel sorry for ourselves. It becomes our identity. So then we have a reason to be bitter and mad at the world. That's sin. Because God did not create you to live that way. Everybody, every one of us have had things and stuff that's happened to us that's not fun and it's not fair, but it happens because we live in a fallen world. But Jesus said, here I am. Give those things to me. Let me take them on me. You get rid of them and so you can be free, truly free indeed to live the life that I have for you, because it's a good life. A life of blessings and favor. A life that, that, uh, that people will see and want to live the same way. Verse 35 says, And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. What's that mean? That means when there was slavery, and there's still slavery today, make no mistake about it, there's hundreds of thousands of slaves all over the world. All over the world. Those slaves get to go into the house of the owner, but they don't get to live there. They have to go live somewhere else. He doesn't, they don't abide in the house. But if you are a family member, you abide there forever. If you have allowed yourself and asked Jesus to come to your life and you are a son or a daughter of God, you get to live in that house forever. You are not a slave. You are not a second-rate citizen. The only thing that makes you a slave is, you, is yourself. If you choose to be a slave, you can be free and free spiritually in Christ. Verse 36, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Free indeed. That means no mistake about it. See, being free means, to me, means to be content with my life. That I can go to bed every night and go, wow, that was a good day. Sure, things happened. Sure, some unexpected things happened. Some things that weren't pleasant happened, but I'm still here. 
The Lord has looked after me. He has protected me. He has guided me. I can't tell you how many. We have no idea how many times the Lord has protected us and we didn't even know it. And all we want to do is complain about how he doesn't do anything for us or he doesn't care about us. That's so untrue. He loves us more than anybody. He loves me more than my family, my wife, my friends. He loves me a million times more. He loves you a million times more the same way. And he wants so much to be part of your life. He wants you to abide in him. And he wants you to live in him and live by his principles so that he can set you free and so your life will be full and content. To be able to lay your head down tonight and go, wow, it's been a good day, Lord. And if I don't wake up tomorrow morning, that's okay. That's okay. You know, Doreen certainly didn't expect to be going to see her father live with the Lord when she died. She'd had open heart surgery. I was with her. She was doing really well on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Monday, I call her. She has 103 fever. They put her in ICU. Her lungs, <clears throat> her lungs quit working, fill up with fluid. Her heart quits. She has heart failure, kidney failure, and she dies at 10 o'clock in the morning. She certainly didn't expect that. And none of us know. He tells us that he'll come like a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming back. We don't know when he's going to call us home. We're not guaranteed our next breath. And I'm not saying this to scare anybody. I'm, I'm speaking the truth. It's the absolute truth. Our life is like a vapor, the Bible says. So all we can do is make sure when that day comes, when that time comes, and he calls us home, we're ready to go. That's all we have control over. That's all we have control over. And, I, and the Bible tells us he doesn't want any of us to be lost. I don't want any of you to be lost. None of you. I want to spend eternity. I want to spend forever with you. Maybe you don't want to spend forever with me, but I want to spend forever with you. What a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land, what a day, glorious, glorious day that will be. You know, this freedom we're talking about, about being real people and experience real freedom, isn't done through a political system, as I said before. What that freedom is, is we're released from the chains that enslave our souls and our spirits. See, those are much more dangerous. See, Chains and stuff that hold us, we can break those chains, but those chains that, that get around our soul are so hard to break. We can't break them. Only Jesus can break those. Those, 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 uh, those chains of fear and greed and, and poverty and doubt and anger and bitterness, those can, get, those can get around our souls and just suffocate us if we don't allow the Lord to free us from those things. We were not created to live that way in freedom or fear or anger or anxiety or in legalism or despair or in racism or, or being gossipers. We're not called to live that way. No, those things are living free. Living free is saying, you know, I love you unconditionally. Unconditionally. What that means, I don't care what you do. I don't care how you act. I'm going to love you. There's not anything you can do about it. And on top of that, I don't expect you to give me anything back. I don't want anything from you. That's what God says. I love you unconditionally, Dennis. Period. Period. No conditions, not if. Now, Dennis, if you'll preach my word, if you'll go to church, if you'll pray every day, then I'll love you. No, that's not what he says. That's not. He loves me unconditionally. And that's how each and every one of us are called to live with each other, is to love unconditionally. Unconditionally. And to forgive 
Every time. Every time. Every, every, every time. Mal's taught us how to forgive. I got mad at her one day, raised my voice, and she said, Dad, don't talk to me like that. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, I can talk to you any way I want. I'm your father. That's I didn't say that, but I'm thinking that. But then my spirit checked me and said, Dennis, you know she's right. There's no reason to raise your voice to her. That kind, gentle, loving soul. Why on earth would you ever think you needed to do that? And so then I went, and then I went to her. I said, Mal, I'm really sorry. You're right. I shouldn't have talked to you that way. She goes, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. When people come to you and ask you forgiveness, you go, sure. No problem. No, we don't do that. We might say it, but we're going, I'm going to get you back. I'm going to get you back. I want my pound of flesh. I want you to suffer more than I suffered. See, and that's not living in freedom. Because unforgiveness will eat you alive. Because it will turn into bitterness. And before you know it, you won't like anybody. You'll think the whole world's after you. And there's nothing good in life. The Lord doesn't want us to live that way. See, this spiritual freedom that we can experience in Christ doesn't change our outward circumstances. It only changes our inward attitude. Listen to that. Being free is not going to change your outward circumstances. There's, there's bad people in this world. There are people who are not nice people. There are people who will take advantage of you. There are people who make fun of you and mistreat you. Your peace doesn't come from them not doing that. Your peace has to come from an inward peace that Christ gives you. See, you are not who those people say you are. I am not who people say I am. I am who God says I am. That's who I am. No matter what I've done in my life, that's not me. That's what I did. I am who God says I am today. And I am forgiven and I am free and I will spend eternity with him. See, Jesus, there's not anything you can do. You're not beyond the reach of, of the Lord at all. If you think just back some of the biblical stories, Paul, Paul had letters to go kill Christians. Jesus struck him blind on the road, changed his life forever. Just like that, bam. Paul was a bad dude. He was killing Christians. Then there was a woman who was caught in adultery. All these people ready to stone her. Jesus, by all rights, could have had her stoned. But he said no. He said, maybe... Whoever has uh, not sinned, cast the first stone. People start dropping the stones and walking away. He freed her. He, what did he say? He didn't go, man, what is wrong with you? What kind of life are you living? Are you kidding me? How can you live that way? No, what did he say? Just go and don't sin anymore. Don't do it again. Don't do it again. And that's what he says to us. But sometimes we do it again, don't we? But when we do it again, does he change his mind? No. He says, no, don't do it again. I can't tell you how many times he's had to pick me up all out of the dust, dust me off, and send me on my way again because I've fallen short. But you know, every day I fall less and less because I know where to go. I know who to seek. I know where to go to when I need help. And it's Jesus. He's the only one who can truly, truly set me free. Then there was a woman at the well who had five husbands. And, and, and Jesus knew it. He got water from her. So she was ashamed. But he, he says, yeah, I know all those things. He says, I'll give you water. You'll never be thirsty again. 
He frees this woman. What does the first, what's this woman do? She goes back to her village and tells everybody in her village about Jesus. And everybody in her village was free. Because of one man. Because of Jesus. Then there's a thief on the cross. Right? He's up on the cross. And he asks the Lord to forgive him. He forgives him. And he said, today you will be spending in paradise with me. Isn't that amazing? He wasn't baptized. He didn't have to go to an altar and kneel and cry. <laughs> He's with Jesus today. He's with Jesus today. He'll be with every one of us. Our spiritual freedom is not depending on our circumstances. Not on our outward circumstances at all. Setting your soul free is more important to Jesus than defeating all the outside threats in your life. Because you don't have to worry about them. You have nothing to fear. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. We're to fear no man or what any man can do with us. We should fear the one who has control of where we spend, where we spend eternity. See, freedom is very purposeful. It's not a lack or restraining of our selfish desires. Genuine freedom takes place when we start living in divine truth. The truth of this word. And Jesus is the only one who can set us free. Fish were created to swim. Birds were created to fly. You and I were created to live in the love of Christ and in his truth. That's what we're created for. And then to be his hands and feet and light and salt in this world. For other people. Let people see the way we live. You don't have to bang people over the head with a Bible. It's going to run them off. We're called to live a life in front of people that is as holy as we can live. People watch how we react to all kinds of things, whether it's how we're mistreated, uh, losing jobs, marriages breaking up, uh, <clears throat> deaths, all those things. People watch us. They know we're Christians. They watch how we react. They're watching to see if, if we're going to live the way we, what we say we believe. And it's not always easy to do. Like Pastor Joe says, it's easy preaching and hard living. And it is hard living sometimes. Absolutely it's hard. But there are some things that get in the way of our freedom. I'd like to list, list a few of them here for us, some roadblocks. One of them is ignorance. <clears throat> sometimes people never become free because they're ignorant and don't know that they can be. How do they find out that they can become free? They can find out through you and me, if we've become free. See, we can't take someone any place where we haven't already been. We can't forgive people unless we've received forgiveness. If we haven't received the forgiveness from God, we can't forgive other people. If we haven't received God's love, we can't love other people like he loves. It starts with him and ends with him. It starts and ends with him. Ignorance, they live in darkness. But Jesus came to bring light to the darkness. Jesus is no longer here on this earth, but he left you and me to be lights in this dark world and the dark lives of people. Second thing that keeps us from being free, experience of freedom is arrogance. Anybody in here prideful? No, don't raise your hands. If I had to guess, I'd say about 99.9% .9 of us are prideful people. We have pride, don't we? We don't like to admit if we're wrong. We don't like to admit that we don't know something. We don't like to admit that we don't have all the answers. We don't like to allow ourselves to be subject to someone else. That's arrogance. Don't, people don't ever come to Jesus because they're arrogant and prideful. Can't let anybody control me. No, I'm tough. I can take care of myself. Wrong. You can't. You might be able to once in a while, but permanently and always, never. Arrogance. 
the Pharisees were arrogant. They said they never lived as slaves. They were unwilling to admit that they'd failed to meet God's standards. They lived by that legalistic code 613. 613 laws they made. Couldn't live by them. We can't even live by regular laws today. How many of you always drive the speed limit? No, we don't, do we? We drive, we go, hmm, if I go, can I get by with driving over two miles? How about five? How about seven? Maybe ten? One of the funniest things that's ever happened in my life. <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe, I have to tell this. We, we, we will travel. We were traveling this one time, and we were driving, and we were going through New York, going to visit our daughter. <clears throat> and so it was her turn to drive. So she says, how fast have you been driving? I said, I've been driving about 75. She goes, oh, okay. So she gets in the car and starts, we've driven, I've driven out how many hours. She gets in the car, drives 10 minutes, and gets pulled over, <laughs> driving 75 miles an hour. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair, does it? But you know what? Life's not fair. Never has been, never will be. If you're expecting life to be fair or people to always treat you fairly, you're living in a dream world. You're going to be disappointed. There's only one person who will never disappoint you, and that's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he will never leave you or forsake you. A third thing that happens is sometimes people are reluctant they have kind of a callous attitude, you know? Well, I've kind of been dealt kind of a bad hand in life, so I, 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 just, I just can't go there. That's a, bunch of, that's a bunch of hocus pocus. That's not real. God doesn't really do those things. Any of us that have walked with the Lord, honestly, know there's not anything he can't do. Not anything that he can't do. He is our promises to be our provider, our protector, our healer, our salvation. Those are all promises, and he cannot lie, and he'll never go back on them. You can trust whatever he says, you can take it to the bank. That isn't so much with us and each other, is it? We lack integrity. God is full of integrity. See, we say, we mean well when we say things, but we don't always follow through. And sometimes even when we say them, we don't mean them. We just say them because we think it's the right thing to say. That's not being real, and that, that's not living in real freedom. It's not living in real freedom. Just like there were some folks here today, I hadn't seen them for a while, and, and I went to them. I said, I'm a little worried. Have I, have I, uh, have I offended you in some way? Because I don't want to offend anybody, anybody. And they said to me, oh, Dennis, you don't have to worry about that. I'll let you know if you do. I'm going, good, please do, please let me know, let me know, I want to know, I want to live in real freedom, I want to live in, in peace with everybody as much as possible, you know, I don't want anything to be between me and my friends, I don't want anything to be between me and you as a congregation, nothing, 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 because there's nothing between me and Jesus. So I'm, I'm called to try to live the same way. The last thing that, <clears throat> that can get in our way, and there are others, but just the other one I, that I had was complacency. People get complacent. They get loss of hope. They become apathetic, careless. And that's a dangerous place to be. You know, the devils were talking to his demons and they were talking to him saying, how can, we, how can we discourage Christians, these people? And the first demon said, well, how about if we tell them there's no God? And Satan goes, well, that's not going to work because everybody knows there's God. There's a God. That won't work. So the second demon said, well, why don't we, <clears throat> why don't we tell them that you don't exist, Satan? And he goes, everybody knows that Satan exists. They'll never buy that. And Satan says, I think this is the best way to do it. Let's just make sure we tell the people that they got plenty of time. They don't have to be in a hurry about living for God. Complacency. 
Oh, I'll go tomorrow. I'll do that tomorrow. I'll go to church next year when I'm done having fun. That's complacency. It's foolishness. Absolute foolishness for any of us. And we know it. You know, it's funny how as we, I can remember when I was young, I thought I was going to live forever. My parents were 50 years old and I thought, man, are they old. Now my wife are going, to be mar- are going to be married 50 years. I'm thinking, holy cow. I'm old. I'm getting there. And I'm not even old yet. I'm older than my wife. She's just a young girl. She's four months old, younger than me. She's just a young chick. But we can get complacent. Well... I haven't, called so and so, I haven't talked to so-and-so for a while. Well, I'll call him tomorrow. You know, I haven't told, I haven't told my son or daughter that I love them for a while. I'll, I'll see him later. I'll tell him later. Those are mistakes to make, folks. How many times have you gone to funerals and the only time you see people that are your friends or relatives are at funerals? It's terrible. It's a terrible mistake we make. I thought my parents would live forever. They've been gone 30 years. They aren't. They weren't going to be here forever. But I'm lucky enough to have been with them when they died that I don't have any regrets and I was able to tell them everything I ever wanted to tell them. But the point is, is that we should be doing that with each other now. Not putting it off. Not putting it off deciding to follow Jesus and allow him to come into our life and make our life and set us free to live as free people of God, being real in our lives with each other. Being real in our lives with each other. It's not, it's not good enough to go to church or to offer, so make the offerings or, or uh, celebrate the holidays. See, There's so much more that the Lord has for us than just being saved. There's so much more he has for us in our life to experience. Now, it's important to be saved, but he doesn't want us to stop there. See, it's kind of like, it's kind of like we go in and, and we, that's bottom shelf stuff, but he has all these things on the top shelf that he wants us to experience in life and experience in this world and experience walking with him. For him to use us in somebody's life. Oh my goodness. There's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. See, I'm convinced that most individuals who call themselves Christians are complacent and choose blessings far below what God has for them. I used to live that way. I don't live that way anymore. I want it all. I want it all. I want whatever he'll give me. And I want whatever... He'll give my family and my friends and whatever he'll give you in this congregation. Don't settle. Don't settle just for salvation. Don't settle. Only settle for everything that God has for you. Well, this process of freedom is not legalistic. There's no magic formula for it. Freedom's not going to come up and say, hey, do you want me? It's not going to do that. And you can't catch it from somebody else because it's not a communicable disease. What it is, it's a choice, a daily choice that you and I make every day of how we want to live. Do we want to live free or do we want to live bound by our past or by the things that are going on in our life at the time? It's a choice. It's a choice you and I make every morning when we get up, what we're going to do, how we're going to live the day. Am I going to live as a blessing or am I going to live as a curse? Are people going to like when they see me coming or are they going to run the other direction? We have to choose, as verse 31 says, to abide in his presence, a free choice. Abide, make him our dwelling place, not as a 30-day trial or a 12-step program, but abiding in him daily. 
It's a place called freedom, and it's found in his word. It's not necessarily its self-help programs or legalistic religions, teachings of Buddha, Muhammad, or anything else. It only comes from Jesus. It only comes from him. Let me ask you this. If you could drill an oil well in your backyard and hit oil and have free gas for the rest of your life, wouldn't that be great? That'd be great, wouldn't it? There's only one problem. There's no oil reserves here in Ohio. There's no oil reserves in your backyard. You can't have, drill down and have gas free forever. You have to go to where there's oil to drill in order to get oil. You have to go, if you want freedom, you have to go to where freedom is. And freedom is in Christ. Freedom is in Christ. If our singers would come back, I don't see you guys around here somewhere. I'm sorry. I forgot to bring them up. I did that last time. I get too excited. You know, it's really important for us to be examples Examples for the world. See, we can't let what goes on in the world affect our happiness or our freedom. Nobody's going to enslave me. We shouldn't be enslaved by anything. The only thing that should enslave us is what, how the Lord wants us to live. I need to be a slave to that. If I'm a slave to that, I'll be a, I'll be a great husband, I'll be a great father, I'll be a great friend. If I can learn to do that first. If I can learn to do that first. There's only one place to find it. There's a deposit of truth in God's word. Just like there's deposits of oil around the world. This deposit of freedom in his word is what will set you and me free. Last week we talked about the Beatitudes and how it was like a... a uh, <clears throat> stair steps to get closer to God. And it all started with what? Anybody remember? Nobody ever remembers last week's sermon. Freedom. Repentance. It all starts with being poor in spirit, realizing that you can't do this on your own. I can't do this on my own. I tried. I was terrible at it. We can't do it on our own. The Lord wants us to call on Him to help Him. Now, if you've never done that, today is the day of salvation. Don't go another second living bound by the things of this world and the things of your past or the circumstances going on in your life right now. Don't be bound. Be free. Let the sun set you free. You'll be free indeed, completely. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for all these wonderful people, Lord, that you have allowed my family and I to be part of their family and part of their life and to minister to them when they allow us to minister. Lord, we take that very seriously. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here in the sound of my voice or watching us via the live stream, Lord, if they don't know you, Lord, that they would right now in their heart, they would say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Set me free. Set me free to live the life you have created for me to live so that I can be the person you've called me to be, the husband, the friend, the father, the grandfather, the aunt, the uncle, whatever it might be. Help me, Lord. I need you. I can't do it on my own. Set me free so I can be free indeed now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to be prayed with about that, while this song is going on or after the service, I'll be glad to pray with you. And uh, I'm so glad you came today. And I hope that the Lord spoke to you in some way. Pastor Joe will be back with us next week. He'll be starting a sermon series on Jonah. And we'll be starting next week. 
and he'll be back. I've talked to him several times. Uh, he's having a terrible time in Florida. I told him, I told him, I said, I hope they close all the beaches. No, I would never tell him that. Yeah, they're having a good time and they'll be back. Uh, they'll be back on Thursday. So keep them in prayer. They've had some good time, rest away. And it's given us an opportunity to minister, which we love to do. And uh, bring somebody back to church with you next week. There's an empty seat beside you, isn't there? Bring somebody here to sit in that seat. All those seats, this church is for all the people that aren't here yet, not for just us. And that's what we need to be doing.